This week on Thinking Biblically, we continue our discussion about parental responsibility in education by looking at home education. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. My name is Alan Gilman. Thinking Biblically is a podcast dedicated to exploring how all of Scripture speaks to all of life. Today, we're picking up where we left off last time when I talked with Professor Scott Masson about the state of education. By the end of our time together, we, we landed on the issue of the role and responsibility of parents in the education of our children, something that this week's guest is also passionate about. Patty Marler is the Government Relations and Media Relations Coordinator for the Homeschool Legal Defense Association of Canada. HSLDA is a national membership-based organization that empowers, protects, and encourages homeschooling families across Canada. Patty holds a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and has worked as both a social worker and career counselor. She's co-authored nine career planning books. As president and government liaison with the Alberta Home Education Association, Patty helped create specialized home education admissions policies for post-secondary institutions and laid the foundation for the notification-only option in the province of Alberta, promoting the rights of Albertan families to homeschool their children without government intervention. She was also one of the founding board members of Parents for Choice Education in Education, an Alberta-funded, sorry, an Alberta-based, non-sectarian, not-for-profit advocacy organization dedicated to informing, equipping, and mobilizing citizens toward an excellent, quality-oriented, choice-driven education system which recognizes parental authority. Patty and her husband Jeff home-educated their four children from kindergarten through high school. Patty understands the everyday challenges and successes homeschooling families face. Patty's passion and home education experience have made her a well-received conference speaker across the country. Patty, thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Alan. Yeah, so before we get into the topic, I should say, for those who don't know this, that my wife and I, who just a few months ago completed homeschooling our 10 children, after 36 years, we started right with our, our eldest, um, right from what from kindergarten level and most of our kids were homeschooled all the way through high school there's a few exceptions there which i won't get into right now um and we've been members of hslda from very early on i was asking my wife yesterday if we could remember when we first joined um and um do you remember when H H H do you know when hslda canada started um i do it was uh Oh, I just wrote this the other day. I think it was 1991 that HSLDA was incorporated. And in 1993, HSLDA hired their first lawyer, Dallas Miller, who uh, who's actually gone on to be a judge in the Court of Queen's Bench in Alberta since then. Yeah, yeah. and we, can't, we couldn't remember exactly when we joined. Uh, we've lived back and forth across this great country and... Um, we're just very grateful for um, the work of HSLDA and glad that such an organization existed. I remember enjoying getting the magazine. Um, and um, yeah, for now, we're still members, even though we're not homeschooling any, any of our children. We're just so glad to um, support an organization like this. So uh, why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about what HSLDA is all about? Sure. Um, HSLDA was founded to protect homeschoolers. Um, it was founded in a time when uh, parents were being threatened that their children could be taken away if they didn't put them back in school. It was a very precarious time for home educators uh, across the country. And um, so, so it was founded to protect the rights of homeschoolers. Since then, with the assistance of, uh, like I said, Dallas Miller, uh, Paul Ferris, uh, who was legal counsel, and the current executive director, Peter Stock, um, the, the rights of parents to home educate across the country uh, has been solidified in um, legislation across the country. So it it is legal to homeschool in every province and territory across the country. There are always blips in uh, legislation. 
uh, where different legislators uh, try to legislate uh, things more, try to make things uh, more difficult, more restrictive for home educators. So HSLDA is a part of that. Um, but HSLDA protects individual members. So when individual members are having challenges with social workers, with uh, school boards, uh, need assistance, with jury duty, um, all sorts of things, then HSLDA is there to help protect them. It's also there to empower homeschoolers because when we homeschool well, we actually need less protection. So HSLDA provides a lot of resources, a lot of services to assist home educators to help them to home educate well. Yeah, so we we first started, um, can't remember the exact date, I heard uh, Raymond Moore on Focus on the Family in the car and came home. Um, um, our youngest, I think we had two little children at the time, and our oldest uh, was not yet school age. And I came through the door and basically said to my wife, Robin, like, like, listen to this and homeschooling, we never heard of it before. And it sounded very intriguing. And somewhere in the mid, maybe around 1985. Um, we were also hearing a few other people in the Vancouver area that were, were doing it at that time. Um, there wasn't, we didn't have any concern that were people that the government was, was concerned. And, um, and we quickly learned that because eventually we ended up moving back to Montreal where we were from and moved back to Vancouver, eventually in Ottawa. So we've homeschooled in, in three provinces and, the 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 homeschooling climate in the different provinces, and you would know this better than me, and especially back in those early days, were also very different. But my understanding is technically it was always legal. I don't know if there's any jurisdiction that actually made homeschooling illegal, as opposed to the United States, where I was at. I got to go to an HSLDA US. Uh, it was actually an international um, convention some years ago, and the story there was. Um, back in the 80s, homeschooling was illegal in almost all, if not all, the United States. But by that time, um, and now we're in the early 2000s, I think, um, it was legal all through the United States. But am I right that was homeschooling ever, I'll ask you this way, was homeschooling ever illegal in Canada? Well, I have to start by saying I'm not the lawyer on the team. <laughs> so uh, interpreting uh, law is not my, uh, you know, what I do. Um, but I think the interpretation of some law by some officials was that it potentially could be. So when you have mandated ages for led for education. So uh, compulsory education is mandated in most provinces across the country. That means students must be in school. Uh, and, and how that's defined, according to some people, um, you know, can be questionable. So, I mean, as a home educator, I'd say, well, my kids are, are in school, uh, because we have our own education program. But in those early age or those early stages of homeschooling, uh, those statements were questioned. Uh, those statements were challenged, uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, to whether or not parents, um, parents could educate their, their kids. And I'm not, I, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the setting for that. I think it was a truancy, um, a truancy case. Uh, but, uh, uh, I know that, um, uh, the interest of the state uh, was decided uh, at the Supreme Court that the state had a compelling interest in the uh, education of a child. And so, again, that sometimes is interpreted differently in different provinces. So, yeah, the interpretation, I think, is where it comes up. Would it be safe to say, however, that parents are allowed to homeschool their children in Canada? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It is legal in every province in Canada now. Yes. Right. And then depending and on territory. your territory. Depending on your your province, there might be regulations or no regulations and this sort of thing. 
It's very interesting. The culture of homeschooling is very different in every province. Um, the the legislation, the requirements, the assistance, uh, the independence, all of those components uh, vary depending on which province you are in and, and territory. So, right. And I, I, I know you may not, I don't know how much you know about what's going on around the world. My understanding is this isn't in some countries, this isn't as straightforward. There are countries where homeschooling can be very difficult. Oh, it can be. Yeah, I think it was recently France where uh, I, 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 I'm I reluctant to say, but I think it was France where uh, homeschooling was made illegal. And there's actually an initiative called the Global Home Education, uh, the Global Home Education Exchange, that tries to address global issues around home education. And HSLDA is a part of that global home education exchange where, uh, you know, up until the time of COVID, there was biannual conferences uh, in different countries across the, pro across the world to um, to talk about home education across the world, to talk about challenges, to assist countries uh, where things aren't going so well in terms of, of the home education environment. Mm -hmm. So what's really at stake here, which brings us to the whole issue of this, this passion that you have for parental choice and education. What's that all about? Why is it important? Why is it important to you? Why don't we start with that? Um, why is it important to me? You know, the, and that's an interesting question because sometimes people say, well, why did you start homeschooling? And the reason we started is very different than the reason why we stayed. Um, and, and the reason we stayed is because we can teach our kids the things that we think are most important. So when you have a school system that has one curriculum, uh, one idea fits all, every student is taught uh, basically the exact same things, um, you really don't get a very diverse uh, society. You really don't get a robust set of ideas. You really have uh, in every education, there are going to be things that are missing. There are going to be uh, components of education that you can't cover because uh, there's millennia of, 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 of history to cover. So we can't cover it all. So you have to pick and choose the things that you cover. And when you have a provincial curriculum that over only covers a certain part of that history from a certain perspective, you lose a lot. And so different people will say, well, you know, there's this part that's missing. There's that part that's missing. Um, and not only that, it's being taught maybe from a worldview that isn't consistent with, with my worldview, with my way of looking at things. And so as a home educator, I can teach from my worldview uh, and teach our children in that way and teach them things that we believe and know to be important. So, something that just came to mind as, as you were talking, uh, this is almost like a school choice issue. And, you know, thinking of, there's such a, in many jurisdictions, most educations become very cookie cutter I think you were alluding to that, but then there'll be the arts high school and the technical high school and, and, and that sort of thing. Then you, of course, you've got, uh, allowances in, in various places for religious education, but what are families supposed to do when they don't have those choices? So there isn't a technical high school. There isn't an arts high school. We didn't know that a lot of our focus in our family would be on, on the arts and our, um, our girls especially were able to pursue uh, something like ballet um, for hours a day as they you know, they didn't have to do their their other homework and, and other work that they would need to do, but they were able to dedicate so much of their time to pursue their their passion, their gifting, their talents that the uh, the, the main 
kind of schooling system would not be able to provide. Now, that's not why we, uh, that's not why we did it in the first place, but that certainly is a compelling reason to allow families to chart their own courses for their kids. Yeah, home education certainly allows uh, for focusing on a student's strengths and allowing them to grow. So you can teach the things that you need to teach. You can make sure uh, that your children know math. Uh, uh, you can make sure that your children know how to uh how to use a measuring tape. And I say these things because of, I have actually heard that those are actually very lacking um, with, with young adults nowadays. They don't know how to do basic math. Uh, I've heard carpenters say, please teach kids how to use a measuring tape. Um, you know, you can teach them basic skills uh, while allowing them to, to grow. Um, I've spoken with a lot of home educators over the course of the last couple of years. A part of my job is to contact people, to contact home educators, to talk to them, to ask them how things are going on. And I've spoken with a lot of new home educators and, and they've said, you know, the amount of time uh, that, that was wasted, uh, not utilized in schools that, um, is now available to their kids allows them to grow in ways that they never have before. It allows them to try things they've never done before. Um, like you, we have kids who, who focused, you know, in athletics and spent an incredible amount of time in athletics that had they been in school, their schedule would have been exhausting and overwhelming. Um, we have kids who 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 focused on music um, in ways that um, I never ever would have thought. But the amount of time that they could focus on their music and over and over and over uh, practicing and studying music while still being able to cover the important things that we wanted um, academically. Um, was, you know, it, it's something that you can do fairly easily as a home educating family. Usually those extra things are thrown into a couple hours in the evenings instead of being a big part of what their, their, um, their day looks like. And you can have that as home educators. You know, when we've talked home schooling with, um, with, with other people, maybe they're considering it so, so many, uh, so often, uh, the reaction would be, oh, I, I can never do that. Parents will say, oh, I can never do that. And our understanding is one of the reasons for that reaction is they're, tr they're picturing bringing the institution institution into their homes. And maybe you've heard stories, I don't know if people are still doing it. They decide to homeschool, they create a schoolroom with a, a whiteboard, blackboard or something with desks and, and, and because that's what school is. And, I, and I've been noticing uh, your tendency to use home education as opposed to homeschooling, which is what we always called it. And I wonder if that has a little bit to do with trying to help people understand that we're not uh, trying to be a, a, a copy of the institution. We're doing something not only different, but we might say even better than what the institution can, can accomplish. Can, can you speak into that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I agree with with you completely. We are not bringing school home. We we are home educating. It, it's very different. I in no way replicate what is done at school. I don't have the same sort of structured hours. I don't have uh, the same sort of uh, curriculum or materials. I don't necessarily use the same sort of books, uh, and I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't have to replicate that. I can, um, man, I do, you know, I think, I think about a typical day homeschooling 
which really means there is no typical day homeschooling. So, you know, we would wake up and and some days we would just spend hours sitting on the couch, reading novels, talking about the characters in the books, talking about uh, the setting of the book, you know, not from a, oh, what's the plot and what's the setting? Oh my goodness. I used to, I was not a fan of English in school, and so I did not want to replicate the things that I disliked about school. So we would talk about who people were. We were taught to talk about what was going on in history when this happened. We would talk about the family relationships. We would talk about dynamics. Uh, we would talk about the words in there that we just didn't understand what what they meant. And, you know, I didn't like to read as a child. I did not like to read at all. And so when I began home educating and I heard all these people talking about, oh, I love this book and I love this author. And, and I really felt like I was completely out of my realm. And I had to say, does someone have a list I can use? And I started gathering books with lists and I started, you know, reading books that were on these you know, good books lists and then books that were on great books lists and, and expanding. And to the point where now I'm one of these people who can talk about many authors, nowhere near as, as most people can, but I can talk about many authors and, and just fall in love with the conversation because I love who the author was. I love what they did in their books. I love, you know, the memories that they had. And our kids, you know, some of those times when you are sitting with a child on a couch, your arm around them, they're snuggled with all their siblings or they're in some sort of arrangement around the couch. Those are times that you remember and you remember the content, you remember the emotion around it, uh, you remember and it becomes significant. And so the study of history comes alive. The study of relationships come alive. The study of, of, uh, of musicians come alive because you understand who the musician is, uh, and you're listening to their, to their music in the background while you're reading about them. Like it's really, uh, an education that's alive. One of the marvelous things that somewhat you're implying is is also how when you're home educating uh you're able to tailor the education to the needs of each of the children and so if if you have someone who's a slow reader or just not interested in reading you could leave that alone you could leave it alone for years and 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 we've we've you know, we've learned through time you know boys especially are are slower in certain in certain things and because they're all thrown in to the institutionalized um, approach to learning um, most often in the public school system they can't tailor the the education to the needs of each of the students so you end up with people feeling feeling that they're stupid you know they're put in a, i don't know if they call them remedial classes like they used to and when, when i was younger uh but they put you know it's the class for the dumb kids and the, there's the class for the smart kids and and you end up with this pecking order and and a comparison which is so much of that is nonsense when you're dealing with a a, a child moving into adolescence and all the differences and changes the, the changes they're going through but then the individual differences between each one, the idea of putting them into a cookie cutter situation actually doesn't make any sense. But if the bulk of a population are going to send all their children into that system, you know, you can't blame the system for trying to be as, as systematic as possible. There's no way they can tailor in the way that a parent can do for, for their own child or, or children. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't even take the time to think of where modern education comes from, because it's actually a fairly new invention. You know, there was a time 
or the poor kids wouldn't get an education and the rich kids had tutors and in home educating families it's more like the the tutor style of approach a very very uh you know one-on-one -on -one, even with the wacky kids like what we were able to do 10 children and 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 there were subjects my wife was able to do with a bunch of kids and others for others of them and some of them they did things they did independently and and we would change courses we went along because we had that kind of flexibility that the the school doesn't have something i like to come back to is is this whole thing though of parental responsibility oh and it is I yeah. Sir, I was going to jump in just on a oh, couple please. things that you say, if if that's okay. Oh, oh yeah, go just ahead. Those, those, those reading um, challenges, you know, um, working with, uh, you know, the irony is that, you know, when I said we started out homeschooling because I didn't want my kids to fall through the cracks reading. And then, you know, when one of your children has, you know, struggles with reading, it, it's like God plays this little, you know, oh, here we go. You know, we're going to we're going to work with you and and make it so that you don't think you're the one who's absolutely in control here. And so I loved, you know, the way that we could approach reading struggles, you know, audio books. Uh, our struggling learner is actually one of the greatest lovers of literature. She loved to listen to, to books. She loved audio. Um, you know, and I say she, because you, you talk about boys, but there's also girls as well. Um, you know, and so, uh, being able to listen, Andrew Pudawa says, uh, he, he, um, he's the founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing. He says that his children ask if he wants them to read a book with their eyes or their ears. And so reading doesn't have to be necessarily just what we read. It can be what we hear as well. And when we read with our ears, we can actually take in a lot more concepts than we could understand if we were just reading it, because uh, sometimes that slows us down. So uh, there can still be a love of literature. There can still be a great growth in understanding of vocabulary, of speaking, of uh, of methods of writing uh, when children have difficulty reading. So um, uh, I love that. And they can go on to be incredibly successful and not have, you know, that uh, grade three stigma of, you know, you have um, have trouble learning. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's a wonderful component of home educating is never having to give up. You know, it's not like when your child's in grade three and they can't three, everyone just gives or can't read. Everyone just gives up on them. You never give up on your child ever ever. That's the thing about being a parent is you never do. So yeah, sorry, I interrupted. You wanted to talk about parental responsibility. And I love talking about that. too. Yeah. And, and you know, jump in anytime. Uh, yeah. So let's let's do that then. Um, can you make a case for parents being responsible for their children's education? As I say it, I feel like, well, of course, but maybe that's because we're we've been home educators uh, all these all these years. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting um, when we were working on um, on on post secondary application with one of our students um, because we had to work a little bit differently because. Uh, uh, in our family, we didn't follow provincial uh, curriculum. We used uh, an abundance of amazing home education curriculum that's available. There's so much good home educating curriculum that's available, and we took advantage of it all the way through high school. Yeah, and let me just interrupt on that one, and and because sure. I, I wanted to mention that for anybody who is interested in homeschooling, one of the home educating, um, one of the huge pluses is, is the amount of resources we have at our uh that we have access to today um there were a lot at the beginning when we started but nothing like was to come and and when we started in in the 80s most people didn't have a home computer yet 
now the access to the, the, the everything that's available online and all the resources and the curriculum. Um, when you, when you send your child to any school, the greatest school there might be, they're they're going to uh, be educated based on the materials that they use. In home educating, you can use anything you want, and it's almost all accessible. And that's mm -hmm. such a huge plus. It certainly is. And and um, just the part of the caution around the COVID years is that because so many students began um, homeschooling at home, in fact, um, HSLDA has done a lot of work in this area trying to figure out the growth. And um, immediately in the year uh, of COVID, that first year of COVID, home educated Oh, home education doubled across the country. And in the year following, it dropped slightly, but those numbers were pretty consistently maintained. Um, and, just, and just to be clear, you're, are you saying these are cases where parents took their children out of uh, institutionalized learning and began to educate their children at home, as opposed to all, of course, all the children were doing these online classes, right? Or not, or whatever they were doing. Yes, so you're talking about yeah. officially taking their kids out of the school they were in. I'm talking about officially being classified as home okay. educators, not, uh, you know, assuming the responsibility for the education of their kids. And that is a problem because so many people think that what they did was homeschooling when they were just doing school at home, that the school was doing on a screen different than what we right. do. So uh, homeschooling so, doubled. Initially, homeschooling double. Okay, mm -hmm. and only dropped slightly last year in numbers, just slightly. So we can we can say that those homeschooling numbers have pretty much doubled since the beginning of COVID. Yeah. So. Um, wow. Yeah, it it is it is amazing. Um, so uh, I th I think I've I've oh so the curriculum. So many people have said, oh, there's so many people and so many teachers have have uh, um, created resources um, that really replicate school that they're offering to students and. So there's a lot more stuff that's available, but it isn't necessarily home educating stuff. So I really encourage parents to check with uh, solid home educating resource providers. We have a plethora of them in Canada. Not a plethora, I shouldn't say that. We have a solid number of them in, um, in Canada. You can actually find a list of them if you go to homeschool.today, so homeschool period today, um, under homeschool resources, there's a whole list of resource providers where you can call and say, "Hey, what would what would be a good resource for my student? Um, they learn this way. They're really an auditory learner. They uh, they have trouble reading, um, and I maybe need some guidance, you know, some structure because I'm fairly new at this. And those resource providers can use those parameters to recommend a curriculum, a good homeschool curriculum that will help you succeed as compared to just, um, you know, something that I see a lot of is just going on Facebook and saying, what's the best math curriculum? Well, you know, that's, there is no best math curriculum. It really depends on the needs of your student, depends on the needs of your family, depends on how you, your child learns, depends on how you want to teach, depends on, on the methods you want to use. Uh, so you, so when you use all that to help make your decision, you can come up with good resources that work well for you. Yeah. And we need to remind people that this is going to sound we're, we're playing up there's so many resources it can be really overwhelming and that's why people will go to facebook people are people ask facebook a lot of things from plumbers to you know what curriculum should i use and mm -hmm. uh one of the wonderful benefits of this part of the history of home education is the amount of support groups that exist of course 
uh, organizations like HSLDA. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage people, if you're interested in homeschooling, to reach out to some of these larger organizations that could send you in the right direction. And uh, especially if you're new at it, you, you need support from other homeschoolers. Yeah. And, you know, homeschooling well is important. You know, it is, we are um, saying, I'm going to take on that responsibility to educate my children well. And so we want to make sure that we do that. There are different methods to do it, some more formal, some less formal, but home educating doesn't mean that we're just going to let our kids do whatever they want. It doesn't mean that we're just going to, you know, uh, um, let them play educational video games all day. You know, those aren't robust sorts of ways to educate your um, your child. And so, um, you know, depending on where you go, you'll get different people providing different thoughts. And so you have to be very critical, which is one of the benefits of homeschooling is critical thinking. You know, we teach our, uh, you try and teach your kids to be critical thinkers. Let's look at that new story. Let's look at uh, the perspective that they're coming from. Let's actually research whether or not it's accurate. Let's be critical in our thinking. Yeah. So let's let's get to our parents. Who who is supposed to carry the brunt of the responsibility of the education of our children? Yeah. So so I believe that. Um, that is parents. Um, you know, we, we are told, um, train up your child in the way sh that they should go and they shall not depart. Um, you know, we are to impress upon our children, um, uh, the love of God, the, 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 the ways of God when we walk with them, when we sit with them, when we talk with them. I'm not, I'm not obviously quoting here. Um, but, but we can do that when we homeschool. We can teach them the things of important, uh, maybe not every minute of every day, but in everything that we do. We we can teach those important concepts. We can in teach. Um, we can teach uh, our faith. We can teach about God. Uh, we can incorporate. Um, you know. You know how how does biology reflect God's creation? You know all those things we can do when we home educate instead of you know putting things in boxes um, or putting things you know individually. Um, just one thought. Um, I just want to finish a thought because I'm not sure if we're going to come back to it. But we we were talking about post secondary, and I had a. a post-secondary um, um, instructors say, well, how, how do I know um, that your, um, your marks, um, the marks that you assigned for your student are going to be accurate? And I looked at them and I said, do you think I'm going to try and set my child up to fail? Like, why do you think I would lie about how well they have done in certain subjects? Why do you think I'm not going to teach them so that they can succeed? Because that's my responsibility. And um, I love my child. I love my children and I'm not going to set them up so that they fail. If I'm home educating, I'm going to set them up so that they succeed. And I think if we have, you know, creative vision as parents for our homeschooling, if we create, um, you know, those goals that we want to accomplish and we continually revisit those, then we are going to help our child succeed. We are going to help them um, to accomplish and become the people whom we want to become. And that vision and those goals are also going to help us to stay the course when things are challenging, because sometimes homeschooling is challenging. You know, you're, that scenario that you, you painted about speaking to the, uh, you know, admissions department of uh, post-secondary education, college, university, or, or whatever. Um, 
there's that under idea that these people would look at a parent's oversight of their child as as less legitimate than the 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 high schools that somehow if it's state sanctioned then it's fine if it's parent sanctioned there's got to be something else going on and if we actually and, and then you you were basically saying I'm 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 gonna paraphrase how dare you how dare you think that I would actually set my child up to fail like this um, but it, it also it begs the it is, is begging the question about the institutions the state run schools as if they don't have ulterior motives in how they mm -hmm. adjust marks and, and that sort of thing is becoming more and more the case where they're evaluating not based on objectivity, but according to uh, ideology. Mm -hmm. uh, while the, the parent, like who could care for a child better than a loving parent? There are exceptions um, because human beings are, are broken. But that brokenness is going to be way more evident and expressed in large institutions than it'll ever be in an individual household and yet yeah. more and more society looks down at that that you know that maverick parent that's you know trying to go against uh the norms of society but as you're as yeah. you're you know in, in god's word and in, in in what we call the torah it it in impresses parents to be the chief educators of our children and it mm -hmm. used to be school the institution was an extension of the family and so you know even ourselves um uh, years ago uh my wife was close with um another homeschooling mom and they traded off some courses it, they weren't a co-op um, they're also, for, for, if you don't know, there are groups of, of homeschooling families that come together and they they share resources. They might have a special day where they do phys ed and, and bring in a special teacher to teach something that the parents aren't able to do. Um, in this case, it was very informal. It was just two friends uh, with different skill sets providing different things to the, these two different families. Um, people can do this. And, and well, and you know, Oh, so, sorry. Oh, we did that. We did that a lot, you know, and people talk about socialization. I mean, well, how are your children going to be socialized? Well, I did want to bring, I did of, bring that up. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. One of the, one of the problems with socialization is that I had to tell my kids, okay, we're stopping seeing so many people. We have to do our schoolwork. No more field trips, you know, no more <laughs> is social, you know, like gatherings with other homeschoolers. Uh, we have to slow down some of that and do our work. But part of what we, um, would do is that, and, and especially when our kids got older. So I would organize, uh, homeschool activities. So I would organize homeschool volleyball, homeschool badminton. I'd rent a gym. Um, I, uh, we would have uh, a year where we would study an advanced biology course. And once a week, kids still do most of the work at home. Uh, but we'd get together and we'd watch special videos and we'd talk about the topic. We'd talk about some of the complex, uh, you know, mechanisms, biological mechanisms. We do experiments together, but incorporated in that was always a break, always a break where the kids got to be together. The parents got to be together, you know, and so we, we had that. I would coordinate homeschool youth groups because in addition to being with people of, of, of like faith, uh, the homeschool kids together, um, you know, it was, it was a good thing for them because then other kids weren't saying, Oh, you know, you're homeschooled. Where do you go to school? So these are things that you can do, you know, to, to make sure your kids succeed academically, incorporate some of those social times, um, have, have, 
have parents who have the expertise. We had a doctor who came to our biology class, um, you know, one of the parents. And uh, you can do mechanics stuff together. And it doesn't have to be real formal. It can be informal stuff, too. But you take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah, and it's also, it's good to remind parents, too. It's something that my wife always uh, speaks up about is, especially when you're first starting with homeschooling with the with the with younger children, younger grades, uh, it's not all that, it's not complicated. Um, if you can read, you can teach your children and uh, and explore things and learn things together. Um, it's only later on where some of those more specialized interests uh, might demand special resources, whether it's in personnel or in, in, in books and, and other things. But getting started actually is, is is pretty easy but one of the things we were learning at the when we were first exploring homeschooling all those years ago was the amount of filler in in institutionalized learning because there's 30 kids and somehow you have to keep them going along at a particular pace and so um that's why the you know the brighter kids get frustrated and the, the slower kids get left behind um, but a lot, there's just so much filler that goes on in, in the institution that you don't need to do. You could, you know, a school day, especially for, you know, the, the younger grades, uh, it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be very long. It all depends on your kids' interests. Mm -hmm. um, now, one of the things that I was also thinking, listening yeah, to some sure. of your enthusiasm and things that you organized, is homeschooling for everyone? I think everyone could consider it. You know, um, there are things to think about when you want to homeschool. Homeschool is a time commitment. You know, I, I've heard of people who say, I want to be able to work full time and put my child in front of, of a video and have them do it all on their own. Um, while I think that may be possible, I think that there is a significant amount that is lacking when that's done. Uh, the beauty of homeschooling is in the interactions. It is in the relationship building. It is in the discussions. It is in um, the robust conversations. Um you know, part of the, part of the problem that I now have working is that I, I spend my money, my mornings, um, walking from place to place to place around the house because that's what I've spent most of my life doing is walking from this place to help this child, moving to the couch to help that child, moving to this table to help, help that child, sitting in this location to read loc to read to a child. So my my mornings specifically have been been spent just simply being available to help kids. Um, so, uh, so I, th I think it's worthwhile considering, um, whether or not you're going to commit, uh, to it. Um, I know there are parents who work and do it, who do it successfully. That requires, you know, coordination and effort, and it certainly can be done. Um, this idea that parents aren't cut out for it. Um, I'm not sure that I necessarily agree with that because, uh, I, I think that home educating really is an extension of parenting. And uh, have, being someone who never had our kids in, in, in a brick and mortar system, um, day one of, of homeschooling just looked like any other day, to be very honest. We just maybe threw in a few extra things. Kind of like when you're teaching your child, you know, to throw a ball, you throw in a few extra things and you just start going. Um, part of the problem is that um, parents have been told that they can't do things. Parents have been told they're not the experts. Parents have told they should leave 
educating to the experts. And I don't buy that. I don't buy in that there are people who know better. And particularly when I know of many teachers who teach in areas that, that are not their areas of expertise. In fact, they are their areas of weakness. And some of them are challenging topics. And uh, they're told to teach kids uh, a subject that they know nothing about. Well, if they can do it, why can't we? Uh, there's so much I have learned. I hated history. English and history were my two weakest subjects. And so I have learned so much about history um, in order to to uh to help my kids you know we learn together you know this idea well you don't know everything you bet I don't know everything and I'm going to learn with my kid and help them or figure out a way to help them would you be able to comment at all on your view of public education today? And is that in the best interest of our child? Or would you just rather leave that to individual parents to work out? Um, I, 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 I think I think it's a it's a challenging place for um, for many students. I recently was speaking with a with a high school teacher who said to me that the issues that children uh, that youth are facing today is unprecedented. It's like nothing she's ever seen in her thirty year teaching career, and she says she feels for uh, for students today uh, the amount that they have to deal with the struggles that they have that it's very difficult. Difficult. Um, and so I think my uh, urging for parents would be to seriously consider, to investigate, to look into um, all of your options. And that includes, you know, the school that you are looking at, you know, what what are they doing? Uh, we had, a, parents had a window into that during, during COVID. They could, uh, parents who wanted could see what was going on. Um, but, you know, don't let someone else tell you that um, you can't be involved in your child's education. You can't know what's going on. You can't uh, be there and find out. And then I think it's our responsibility as parents to make those best choices for our kids. And sometimes they can be hard choices for us, but when we do them with the best interest of our kids at heart, then we can make better choices. I wonder how many parents have actually looked inside the box of education today to see what's really in there to see what their children are being fed and you know we, from where we're sitting uh you know we can't we can't make comments about individual teachers and classes and schools and all the rest but parents indeed have a responsibility to at least know what their children are being exposed to and of course if this was if if their kids are getting what their parents want them to get that's that's their business but i wonder if we allowed ourselves to open up that lid and look inside how ha you know what would we be happy about what we, what we see there and which brings us back to the yeah. parental responsibility thing um most parents in canada today would accept the fact that they're responsible for what their children put into their bodies uh, their mm -hmm. their diets they just don't let their kids go and eat we might from time to time, but we know, <laughs> we know we're responsible for that. And uh, the information uh, nutrition is just as important. And, uh, and so we do want to encourage parents to to make informed choices about the education of their children. Um, for sure. And you know, what goes, sorry, what goes into their mind, what goes into their heart, those are significantly important things. Um, you know, uh, as, as, um, like you said, I, I was a part of, um, Parents for Choice in Education. And, uh, if, if you go to, to that website, Parents for Choice in Education in Alberta, I know that they have done a lot of work on looking at some of the things that, um, happen in schools, some of the places, uh, that are explored, some of the, uh, some of the links 
that um, that students are able to get to through their through their school contacts, and so. Um, you know, some of that is available through other organizations without you having to dig yourself. Um, so, yeah, those are, uh, you know, some places to be able to go. And in this whole COVID era that we're in, uh, obviously parents, a lot of parents knew very quickly that they educating their own children would be better than what the schools were offering or not offering during COVID. And sadly, this is not over and uh, we need to be thinking for the long term for our kids and make the best decisions for them as, as possible. And I, I'm grateful for and our conversation. Yeah, go ahead. One, one really encouraging thing is that I have talked to so many parents who said, I never thought I could do this. I, I only did it out of necessity. And this is so good. This is good for me. Like our stress level as a family has gone down. My kids' health is better. The anxiety that my kids are, our experience is reduced. My anxiety is reduced. We're excited. My kids are excited about learning. Um, my kids no longer have headaches. Um, you know, all of these things that I've heard from parents, uh, it's really incredible the changes that they experienced and very encouraging. And so many have said, you know, I was only doing this for, you know, one year through COVID and I am never going back. Like, um, try it, try yeah. it. And I want to remind people and, again, and yeah, just, I just want to remind people that we're not talking about school at home. We're talking about home education and all the mm -hmm. flexibility and resources that are available to, to do that. Um, and I know for some people, I would imagine their home education experience has been school at home and they never want to do that again. We're talking about something very different. Is there anything mm -hmm. in, in closing yeah. that you'd like to add? Um, you know, there is, there is help available, you know, um, homeschool.today has a lot of, uh, like, I think there's over 70 frequently asked questions about homeschooling, where you can go and get your questions asked. Uh, at HSLDA, we have a lot of resources that are available. Interesting how many parents are pulling their kids in high school, sort of an unprecedented uh, number, I think, because, uh, you know, they're, they're not happy with what they're seeing. Um, at HSLDA, LDA, we have a lot of resources to help people to build transcripts, to help people prepare for, you know, prepare uh, for post-secondary, to be able to do research so that they can homeschool well, to prepare, prepare their kids for the future. Um, uh, family, family is... Um, this is a different tangent, but family, doing family homeschooling is uh, the most amazing way to do family. Uh, if there is one decision I could make over again, uh, it would be homeschooling and I would do it exactly the way I did it, maybe with minor changes, but I would do it again because it was one of the best decisions that we made for our family. Oh, uh, one more thing, really, really important. Um, why should Canadian homeschoolers join HSLDA? Um, HSLDA has really has a lot to offer homeschoolers um, to empower uh, and uh, to empower your homeschooling. We have a digital library with over 25 500 digital books. We have resources, uh, including curriculum consultations, special needs consultations to help you educate your special needs um, students. Um, we have resources to help with high school. We have free preschool memberships. Um, we have uh, information on uh, how to homeschool. Uh, most importantly, we have 24-7 uh, legal assistance available to you should you ever need it. Um, I know I have valued that uh, very much uh, and, and used it myself. Um, so I am, I'm, and, would I be right uh, to say- And then so, the background. Would I would right to say that HSLDA is, a, is like legal insurance for homeschoolers? 
that is one way that many people look at it. Yes. And yeah. It, yeah. And and in speaking of insurance, we actually have uh, insurance for groups, group liability insurance. We can connect people with that because sometimes that's really hard for groups to get. But yes, that it, it's like it's like a layer of protection. So you don't have to worry. Right. Mm-hmm. So if something should happen and some uh, ornery neighbor calls child services on you and somehow, and it's, it rarely happens, but there have been some stories. Uh, if, if the authorities knock on your door and you're a member of HSLDA, they will represent you what I, it, all the way up the ladder, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, member families, we do. So you need to be a member first. You can't have trouble and then call us. So you need to be a member first. And our our lawyer um, isn't sitting back and very rarely connecting with people. She's actually quite busy. Right. So anyway, so that's we've always my wife and I've always encouraged people if you're homeschooling, join HSLDA. I don't get anything out of this mm-hmm. plug, by the way. This is this is for you folks. It's it's such a um, an, a needed service and a helpful service. So we do encourage you to do that. Again, check out the link uh, in the description. So if you um, um, have any questions on, on this, you could always um, email me, and I could pass anything on to to, to Patty that that's appropriate. Uh, Patty, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed our time, Alan. So again, if you have any questions, you can send them to comments or comments too at comments, comments at thinkingbiblically.org. The links we talked about will be in the description. And, And so until next time, this is Alan Gilman with Thinking Biblically. 